What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to Call Game, Kenny Pharrell, whatever you want to call it. I cannot believe we saw one of the greatest performances of all time, and I am not exaggerated when I say that. One of the greatest performances of all time was today, and it was by an undrafted player. L listen, I think it was Shams that tweeted that Fred Van Vliet putting up 54 today passes the record held by Moses Malone for the most points scored by an undrafted NBA player. Now, raise your hand if you knew that Moses Malone was undrafted. You're better than I am because I had no – Moses Malone was an undrafted player? The more you know, the more you know. We have to start off talking about Fran Vivley in this in this game, man. They beat up on the Orlando Magic game who are still fighting injury and stuff. We'll talk about them in a little bit. But this game right here was so, so very special, man. When I'm, t when I'm telling you this is one of the greatest regular se season performances ever, I am not exaggerating. Some of y'all may understand the idea of game scores, something that was created on ba I, I don't, well Actually, I don't know if it was created on Basketball Reference, but that's why I found it, where it takes into consideration the amount of points you score, assists, rebounds, all of your counting stats, your efficiency, and all of that, and it gives you a final score. The higher the score, obviously, the better the performance. And I was doing something on Twitch last year where I was trying to go through every single great performance in NBA history and just watch it. Fred Van Vliet after this game has a, I think it was the 22nd greatest regular season performance in the history of basketball. Can you believe, today, on this random Tuesday, we just saw history. This man put up 54 points, shot 74% from the field, hit 11 threes on 78%, also racked up three blocks, also racked up three steals, and ultimately got the W. Ridiculous. And if you watched how we did, I would recommend going back to watch this game for anybody. And if you can just get to the highlights, get to the highlights, man. Because some of the shots he was hitting wasn't just open shots in the corner, open shots on the – this man was hitting Steph Curry range threes. He was hitting it off the dribble. And then it got to the point, and, and this is my favorite part about this performance, at the end, I don't know if he was whispering to Evan Fournier. He was like, bro, I'm four off, bro. I'm four off. Can you just let this slide? The man cut back door. You would have thought Evan Fournier was playing for the Toronto Raptors because he did not react whatsoever. And it happened two times for him to get that 54. And I, I was thinking about it like this. If I was on the opposing team, if I was a part of the Orlando Magic, would I want to see or allow him to get that last four? Or would I be sending every defender we have to prevent history being put on us? You know what I'm saying? Fred Van Vliet is such a nice guy that maybe I'm like, Freddie, you torched us all game. Take that easy four. I, I don't really know. I don't really know. But this is crazy coincidence because today on my podcast, me and my homies were talking. We were talking about Cal Lowry as a free agent because if you didn't know, he'll be a free agent this offseason. And and somehow we got into the conversation of Fred Van Vliet because he signed this big old contract um, in the in the offseason. And I just posed a question like, has Fred Van Vliet lived up to the contract through the first month of the season? And I think that most of us are like, no, not really. And I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that the Toronto Raptors at this point is still underperforming. If he was still putting up the same, I think it was 18 points per game before tonight, <laughs> that's going to jump up. If he's putting up that same 18 points on decent efficiency, we'd probably be like, yeah, he's living up to the contract if they were winning. But the fact that they weren't winning um, kind of hurts that. But him coming out here putting up 54 is, is so ridiculous. Because in the beginning of this game, it was starting to look really bad because I think the Orlando Magic came out on like an 11-0 run. Pascal had missed like his first three shots, and they were looking for somebody to pick it up. And then Fred Van Vliet actually scored the first bucket for them this game, and then he did not stop. He did not stop whatsoever. And it was an overall amazing, amazing performance, one for the ages, man. To hit 11 threes on 14 attempts is mind-blowing. And, and what makes it so special is it wasn't just an offensive performance. He ended with three blocks at six foot, basically, <laughs> three steals. And and I think um, one of the homies, because, you know, we do these things, we watch the games together all over Discord or in the Xbox party, whatever to call it. And one of the homies was like, imagine if he was 6'6". If Fred Van Vliet was 6'6", with the way he plays defense right now at six foot and the way he scores right now at six foot, he'd be one of the best players in the league. He'd be like an all-star caliber player just, just by adding a couple inches to his height. So amazing performance by him. Um, and this is a step in the right direction. I think I say this every time the Toronto Raptors win because I think we all know the Toronto Raptors aren't as bad as the way they started the season, not even close to as bad as they started the season. They're just trying to get it going. And now they're sitting at 9-12, and 12, ninth seed, baby. They be in a play-in right now. A lot of basketball left. Um, let me talk about the Orlando Magic for a quick second. This was another game. Um, we found out that Aaron Gordon is going to be out for a significant amount of time. They can't catch a break with the injuries. But it, this might be a blessing in disguise because um, from everything I've read and everything I heard, the 2021 draft class is established as I don't know when um, and this this is a team that could definitely benefit from having a top five pick for sure and while you're at it I know you got Nick Vucevic but I would love to see more Mobamba minutes now I am in a camp of how, having a player earn his minutes and not just giving it to him because of something but it's like y'all wasted such a high pick on him 
him getting, what, three minutes late in the fourth quarter when they were already down by a lot seems a bit seems a bit bad, right? And from my understanding, he's fully healthy now. You know what I'm saying? He should maybe be getting more minutes. But I know uh, Steve Clifford is a, I want to win right now, coach. When in reality, they should probably be doing a little. They should be giving Mo Bamba, Chumo Kiki, and Cole Anthony all the ride in the world because that's, that's their core right now until they end up with this top pick because the way the injuries are going, <laughs> them boys are hitting that lottery. And maybe they hit big. You never really know. Next game might be. Um, the game of the year. You asked Jamal Crawford. Jamal Crawford asked on Twitter, is it the game of the year? And it might be. It was the Clippers losing to the the uh, Brooklyn Nets today. First of all, they had the Basquiat jerseys and the Basquiat court. It's just a beautiful match. The court is even better than the jerseys. I like the jerseys. But the court, to see, mm, beautiful. And this had, this is game of the year potential. The way it was back and forth, back and forth, and it kind of was a chess match. This is one of the first times this season that I can say I felt like Steve um, Steve Nash, I almost said Steve Kerr, Steve Nash was out there really, really coaching and playing chess. It was beautiful. I mean, first of all, they start off like, DJ, you're coming off the bench for us. We're actually going to start off the game with our small ball lineup. <laughs> Jeff Green, get in that center position. And and it didn't hurt them as much as you would expect, right? You would expect them to get killed on the glass and, and though I think they did get a rebound in this game, I don't know how many of those offensive rebounds Bounce turns to second chance points, and that's really what it's all about. They they held their own on the glass again. They did get outboarded, but it wasn't like by a dramatic amount. And believe it or not, what what was the real key to me this game? Of course, it was the fact that Kyrie Irving hit so many shots. Kevin Durant was <laughs> shot eleven for thirteen, but James Harden. I don't see a world right now where James Harden doesn't lead the league in assists this season. There's no reason for him not to. With the amount of weapons that the team has offensively, there's no reason for him not to. But the thing that that really helped them out this game is there was a period of time where, like, Paul George was struggling, and they were trying to give Kawhi the ball because Kawhi is like a mismatch nightmare for a lot of people. And they were trying to give Kawhi the ball in the place that he loves it, which is, like, back to the basket, kind of like at the elbow, sometimes at the block, and James Harden was the guy guarding him. Now, NBA nerds have been talking about this for a couple years now, about James Harden being a fire hydrant and one of the best post defenders in the league. People don't want to accept it because you remember like four to five years ago, there were so many of these clips on Twitter of James Harden basically just standing still on defense, getting beat back door. He was an absolute terrible defender, possibly the, ter the, the worst defender in the league back then, but he's a lot better now. And a lot of that is in that post defense. So when, when they got to the point where Kawhi was trying to back him down, he was like, nope. Not going to do it. Overall, this game, James Harden's defense was pretty solid. And that's that's very that's very promising for them. The the thing that makes this team dangerous is not not that, not the defense, obviously. It is the offense where Kyrie Irving was cooking and cooking and cooking. And you know what? The, the L.A. Clippers have great defenders, right? They have Kawhi Leonard. They have Paul George. They didn't have Patrick Beverly tonight, which I think could have helped them potentially win this game. Um, Nick Batum is still a positive defender. They have good perimeter defenders. But it felt like, okay, whenever – Kawhi got put on Kyrie after Kyrie went on his own personal run. He like, all right, I guess I got Kawhi now. Here, Kevin, your turn. Isn't that crazy? No team is going to have enough defenders to guard all three of these dudes on the offensive side of the ball. If this team could just get the defense together, <laughs> the offense is going to be there. This, this team has the ability to, um, to, to, to really outperform a lot of the good teams in the league, like when you when you think about when the losses they have, they have two losses to the Cavs, a loss to the Wizards a, a couple days ago. But when it comes to them going against like the elite championship quality talent so far this year, they've they've won. They can do that. Now, can they do it in the seven game series when you get adjustments, things like that? I don't really know. But it's very promising to see them be able to do this. And and maybe those that watch the game, or maybe those Cavs game is kind of planned to the competition. But they showed out. I mean, it's something about national TV for the Brooklyn Nets. I think they're undefeated on national national TV, not in, not like the NBA TV stuff. They're undefeated still this year, and they can they can come out and play, man. Again, still worried about the defense a little bit, but today was a step in the right direction. It's very promising to see what they did because it, would, would a team have this many elite isolation players, it is impossible to guard it all. It just is. And you have a night like tonight where it feels like all three of them are on, counted as an L. But for the Clippers, all that being said, they had the, the, the Brooklyn Nets had all three of their superstars playing amazingly tonight. And yet the Clippers were still in the fight. And that's even with Paul George not necessarily shooting the ball well. The Clipper I, I told you I wanted to make an entire episode with the Clippers like a focal point and I I think I still want to do that. Um but they're they're on the process of having this crazy road trip right now, five games in seven nights. It's ridiculous. It's it's crazy. And they just did this where they held on to one of the most stacked teams in the NBA right now. We're we're currently in in the process of seeing the most effective offensive team two years in a row in history. So, like, last year, the Dallas Mavericks put up the highest offensive rating of all time. 
right now the Brooklyn Nets are on pace to beat that from last year. We continue to just level, like, like get the bar higher and higher on the offensive side of the ball. And the Clippers held their own against that without having a guy like Patrick Beverly, without having their bench rotation play that well. Mook had a good game, but, like, Lou Williams still ain't really done that. Lou Kennard still can't, can't really hold himself in the rotation. I'm still super, super high on the Clippers, man, even after this loss. And this was not a bad loss. Sometimes you get bad losses. This was not one of them for the Clippers. They should be okay with this. They should be, I mean, nobody wants to lose, but this they should be okay with this. They got another game, I think, tomorrow, like I said, five and seven nights, which is a crazy road trip. Um, and then they can get back home and get things going. One of the, the games, that, the game that I did not watch um, this year or this this day was the Grizzlies losing to the Pacers. So I don't have many takeaway from this, um, but the Grizzlies lose this one. I mean, it's OK. They were just on like a six game winning streak. So I'm, I'm guessing they're fine. with like, Everything has to end. You know what I'm saying? Um, the Trailblazers end up getting the win against the Washington Wizards in a game where it felt like Gary Trent could not could not miss a shot. Like, I think, and y'all know I be doing these bettings, um, his over-under on the three-pointers were like 3.5, and I took it. I was like, he can hit four threes today. He had that in like the first half, bro. And I knew that this is going to be a super high-scoring game because it is the Portland Trailblazers who are missing so many players, and it is the Washington Wizards who like one of the worst defensive teams in the league. And it ended up being that it was a shootout, it was a dogfight, and it was a fun game overall. It was a fun game overall. Uh, Daniel Dia had one of his better games with like the full cast. I know that we saw Daniel Dia have a good game when like Bradley Beal and, and, and Russell Westbrook were both out, but like – Playing in the flow of the offense was good today. Rui Hachimura had his best game of the NBA season. Um, and those are the promise of things when you, when you talk about your younger players. They end up catching the L. And then it came out today that, like, again, I think I mentioned this on the last episode, us fans have been trying to get Bradley Beal out, but he is completely bought into the Washington Wizards, which is, which is an understandable thing as far as, like, career goes. Because there were plenty of opportunities in my short career where, like, I had the opportunity to move to New York. I had the opportunity to move to L.A. for work. And I was so afraid to. I didn't want to move. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just find a spot like me in Chicago right now, and you don't want to move from that spot. And he's building a family. I ain't even building a family yet. I can't imagine if I had kids right now, I'd be like, okay, we got to we gotta uproot and move to another city. So he's just going to work in D.C. every day until further notice. The next game was a very interesting one because the Jazz were up by 30, and I stopped watching. And I was keeping an eye on it because the other game, the, the Celtics and the Warriors, was so close. And then the <laughs> they, they say you live by the three, you die by the three, and the Jazz almost died by the three because the, the um, Detroit Pistons went on a huge, huge run where the Utah Jazz couldn't hit anything. And you had another good game from Jeremy Grant who continues to to uh, surprise us. Josh Jackson is such a great story so far this season. And he had a little a little maybe week or two um, this season so far where he went like kind of tanked a little bit. But now he drops a 22. They couldn't close it out. They had a couple couple open looks at the end of it. But the Jazz, I think Bogdanovich hit a big shot at the end. And that kind of put him over the hump. And Bogdanovich, I think the, the first time we were talking about them a couple days ago, we were talking about the Utah Jazz, I was saying that Bogdanovich really hasn't found himself yet. You know, you still average 13 points per game, not shooting it efficiently. Since then, he's been really good, and that is scary. That is scary for the rest of the league if Bogdanovich is now picking it up and they end up getting this win, quality win for them. And then the last game, um, the Celtics end up getting a win on Wardell, Stephen Curry, and the Warriors. Before we talk about the Boston Celtics, I want I want to say this to everybody. I want I want everybody to hear me, and I got a I got a couple minutes to tell this story. When LeBron James went to the Miami Heat, um, I absolutely despised him. Not just because he built a six uh, a big three and potentially ruined the league. Remember, I'm at this point I'm probably 13, 14, so I'm a teenager. Um, but because he destroyed my team night in and night out in the playoffs. That's when I realized that regular season doesn't really matter too much because the Bulls will always beat the Heat in the regular season series but always lose to them in the playoffs. Um, I hated LeBron in those Heatle days. And and obviously things have changed significantly since then. And now I look back on it like I wish I didn't hate LeBron during those days. I feel like I missed out on so much great basketball because I was hate watching him instead of just watching him, right? I'm saying all of that to say because I keep seeing people um, from the Steph, the Stephen Curry camp and the Damian Lillard camp go at each other on Twitter. Who's the best point guard in the league? And they hate each other because both of them, both of these fan bases see the other as a competitor, you know. And, and I'm telling everybody that's in those two camps that are arguing every single day between this and not really enjoying these games, please cut it out and just enjoy greatness. This is much CTV. And if you're not, if you're hate watching it, you're not getting the full extent of Damian Lillard, of Stephen Curry because of that. You know what I'm saying? I think in my old age of 24 years old, I, I'm more understanding of just greatness while it's in front of me. You know what I'm saying? So please, please just enjoy greatness. I know Steph Curry didn't get the win today, but it was it was moments in this game where the man felt literally 
unguardable. And I would say Kemba Walker overall did a pretty solid job on him, especially in that second half. But it's still some, Steph Curry still has this thing where there is just shots that he's going to throw up and you just have to accept that it's going in no matter what you do. They end up losing this game. And I, I think they only lose this game because they don't have a center. Kevon Looney ends up spraining his ankle. They are already losing James Wiseman because of injury. So they literally didn't have a center. And there was a lot of possessions in this game where the Boston Celtics got second chance points because um, Tristan Thompson or Daniel Tice is down there getting a bunch of boards. It was an ugly win for the Celtics because of that. Like like Jalen Brown didn't shoot the ball well. Kippa Walker didn't shoot the ball well. But they grinded out this game. And a win is a win at the end of the day. One of my biggest regrets going into the season, though, is that I didn't buy more Jalen Brown cards. I didn't expect this man to take off and be a, a bona fide all-star. I didn't. I knew he was going to be better. I didn't know that better was like guaranteed all-star, potential all-star starter. So now I wish that I would have bought in more. Because right now, I'm I'm going to do a lot of more card videos, by the way. Uh, I'm a PSA like 10 of Jalen Brown's rookie card. It's like three to $500, bro. And six months ago, it was not that. And I wish I would have bought in this six months ago. So, yeah. Ugly win for the Boston Celtics. Fun game overall. And that is my Slater game. Shout out to Fred Van Vliet, man. Keep bet on yourself, bro. Something that I live by too. And y'all, y'all about to see that very, very soon in the next month, man. I have a trip to LA. They could potentially change a lot of things. And I'm betting on myself. You know what I'm saying? Appreciate y'all. Call game.